this is a recording for the practice final test and the first one it says here is match the following and then there are planets here and then there are descriptions of these planets and the way to figure these out is to go to my website that I have hosted several times in this class click on lecture notes click on peculiar planets and this is where you would find all the answers give you a few um, examples so as I scroll down here you have seen this before because you were supposed to use it for some of the homeworks so I'll give you some um, example um, it is just a large enclosed object of the Kuiper belt and therefore it is not considered a planet anymore and that would be Pluto this planet could float in a bathtub this is Saturn as I said you would find these answers in the my own website that I just pointed out. Cloudbound's a great red spot, that's Jupiter, the most spectacular rings of all planets, Saturn, this planet would have extreme seasons, that's Uranus, and so on. Then for the next one, note that some of these are repeat state statements. This time, however, you match them with the most likely cause of the phenomenon. So the most spectacular rings of all planets, that would be Saturn. And when you look at these here, total of axis gravitation, tidal force, again, you'll find that in the lecture notes that I pointed out. This planet would have extreme seasons. A day at the North Pole lasts 40 Earth years if it was habitable. Well, that's Uranus, and what it's caused by is the tilt of the axis. Its discovery was one of the greatest accomplishments of the law of gravitation, and that would be, well, gravitation. And to show you these as examples on my own website, here would be Neptune. One of the greatest accomplishments of astronomy was the discovery of Neptune, um, which could be only explained by another planet. Its gravitational pull disturbing Uranus. Uranus itself, Uranus axis is tilted by 90 degrees. If it were habitable, which it isn't, it had seasons. And had seasons. Um, you would see the sun above the horizon for 42 Earth years off of Uranus orbit. For Saturn's rings, the most likely theory, um, and you can read through this here, orbiting closer and closer until it reached a Roche limit where the entire moon was ripped apart by tidal forces. So, as I said, that's how you find the answers to these two questions. Your personal opinion, which planet would you consider to be the most astonishing one? You can choose any planet you want. Same website here. Older maps show large uncharted areas due to lack of satellite data. That's Mercury. The sunrise in the west sets in the east. That's Venus. When observing, photographing the sun over a full year, exactly the same time every day the NLM has revealed. That's Earth. And so on. And again, some of these are repeat statements. The sunrise in the west sets in the east. That's the tilt of axis for Venus, which is completely turned around. When observing the sun, the analemma is revealed. That is tilt of axis. Since the orbits are small and Earth, they are only visible at dawn or dusk. Mercury and Venus. Phases of our moon ex explain why our moon exhibits phases. The diagram shows the moon's position for the course of six evenings and down here is the sun. Sun apparently setting in the southwest, so this must be during winter. And here's the moon exhibiting more and more crescent phases on day one, day two, day three, day four. Actually that's probably already day two, day three, day four, five, six, seven. And so what's happening is the further it gets away from the sun, that means the further along in its orbit that it gets, so the geometrical positioning between sun, earth, and moon, the larger the face becomes. And the reason for that is that as the moon's as the moon is lit up half at all times by the sun, we here on Earth can see more and more of the sun's lit up half. I'm sorry, the moon's lit up half. The further 
it gets away from the sun, that means the larger the angle becomes between the moon and the sun. And so further and further away, here's the half moon. And then, of course, if this went on, then the angle becomes even larger. And we can see more and more of the gibbous, which we call in the gibbous phase, and up to the full phase. And then it gets closer after the full moon. Closer to the sun, the angle becomes smaller, and we see less and less of it. If the sun set due west, which it does in March and September, describe where and how you would see the moon in its phase on the fourth or fifth day of the lunar cycle. Around sunset, so this diagram here doesn't completely go with that question because it said that if the sun sets in the west, so we assume that we push the sun over here to the west and then we're in the fourth or fifth day and it says so this is about the first, second, third, fourth day and, and again take this picture here and move everything further over to the west so this one here would then appear in the southwest and we would see a waxing crescent in the southwest for this particular as the answer for this particular question. Again, this picture does not go with that next question, but I used it because it's close enough and all I have to do is push that sun over to the west, just as that next question was saying. At what time of the day would a crescent moon appear just above the western horizon? Well, just after sunset because it's really close to the sun and if it's just after if it just above the western horizon and it's really close to the sun that means the sun must have just set near the western horizon or on the western horizon at what time of the day would the full moon be just above the eastern horizon also just after sunset because by definition the full moon is exactly opposite of where the sun is so if the full moon is above the eastern horizon, that means that the sun must be below the western horizon. And therefore, this is just after sunset. The drawing on the left shows the sun starting to be eclipsed by our moon during a solar eclipse as seen from Earth. Of course, we can see our moon's surface because sunlight can reach the side facing us during this phase on the new moon. The drawing on the right shows Sun and Earth from outer space describe where our moon is positioned and where and how its shadow points. So again what it says here on the left here is that we cannot see actually the moon. We would see would be seeing its its dark side that is not illuminated by the sun, but I put it in the picture here so that we can see, hey, this is the moon here. And so during the solar eclipse at this point it's it's partial solar eclipse. Well, the moon has to be between Earth and and Sun, so somewhere along here. It's relatively close to Earth with a small orbit, so it's somewhere here close to Earth, and a shadow points towards Earth, of course, because the Sun shines this direction here and here is we where we would have the Moon, and then its shadow from here would point this direction here, of course, away from the light source, and if it's exactly between Earth and Sun, onto Earth itself just like this image shows. On June 15, 2011, you may be standing outside at 1 p.m. local time in Alaska in broad daylight during the middle of a lunar eclipse or the lunar eclipse. Describe what you see and then I put in brackets, this is a trick question. Okay, so here it says describe what you see. Well, you should be seeing the moon being eclipsed by the Earth. But that also means that the moon needs to be in the sky, so you have to figure out where in the sky is it. Well, this is, you may be standing outside at 1 p.m. local time in Alaska, which means that not the moon, but the sun is high in the sky in the south. After all, it's June 15th, so it's high in the sky in the south. The moon being eclipsed by the sun has to be a full moon because it's a definition of a lunar eclipse and therefore at the opposite side of the of where the sun occurs so with the sun being high in the southern sky the moon has to be low in fact below the northern 
horizon, which means the moon isn't even in the sky. That's why this one is a trick question. If you weren't in Alaska and if you were if you were not in Alaska and you would be observing it elsewhere, for example in Asia or, or Europe, um, on that day around midnight or so, you would be actually seeing that lunar eclipse. So we're missing out on this particular one.